I'm really excited about our next talk. It's titled Leveraging Data-Centric AI for Document Intelligence and PDF Extraction. senior machine learning engineer at Snorkel AI and plant enthusiast, Ashwini Ramamuthi. Thank you for the introduction, Rebecca. Um, I'm super excited to talk about document extraction here. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen now. Can you confirm if you're able to see my screen? Looks great. Yeah, awesome, thank you. Yeah, so I'm really excited to talk about uh, how we've been using data-centric methods for document extraction at Snorkel. Um, and in today's talk, I'm going to follow this outline. Um, I'll start with defining what we mean by document extraction, some of the key challenges we've faced with extracting from documents, um, and how we've tackled that using Snorkel's data-centric approach. Lastly, I will talk about some of our forward-looking work using foundation models to supercharge our data-centric approach. So what is document extraction? Um, so by this, we mean the process of extracting out structured information from semi-structured and unstructured documents, such as PDFs, HTML files, docx files, and so on. This is a very common use case for enterprises. Um, lots of enterprise organizations have hundreds of thousands of documents, and they have this need to be able to extract out structured information that they can then use for their downstream analysis. So some common examples of this are like um, clinical trial documents, um, financial filings, um, you know, invoices, uh, yeah, uh, like agreements, contracts, etc. So the use cases for this are really wide and varied. Uh, and I also want to make a quick note on on terminology here. Um, we are calling this document extraction, but you've probably seen this in different places be referred to by like different terms that are sort of overlapping. Uh, like so, some common terms that I've seen are like document AI, document intelligence. PDF extraction, intelligent document processing, and so on. And they all refer to the same process um, of being able to extract out structured information from these documents. So what are some of the challenges with this document extraction process? I think the one of the main challenges is that there's very high data availability. Um, so um, these documents were typically constructed for human consumption. So there's no like fixed structure that um, you know the user has to refer to when they're you know presenting this information. So in this example here, this these screenshots are all like referring to the same entity, but they're represented in a variety of table formats and sentence structures. Uh, and all of this is accessible to a human, but it can be really difficult to automate with a system. Um, and so you can imagine that if you had a rule-based system, it would fail just given the high data variability inherent to this problem. Uh, and pre-trained models also have this problem. So you could have a model that's been pre-trained on an existing data set, uh, but it might not generalize to your data just because that distribution is a little bit different and it hasn't seen those particular examples before. Um, so you might say that I can manually annotate my data and you know train my own models to be able to extract out these um, these values but there's a range of problems associated with that um, the first is manual annotation is, is really slow um, and can also be really expensive so imagine you had like clinical trial reports and you needed doctors to go annotate those documents um, that's not the best use of their time and it's probably also going to be quite expensive for you to put together that data set just in terms of the number of hours uh, clinicians are spending on it. And lastly, this process is inflexible. So um, you could start this process of annotation using a certain label schema, and then during that process, discover that you actually want to change the schema that you're using. This is like really 
you know, like you would have to kind of go back and start from scratch in this process. Uh, you can't reuse any of your existing work. And this actually happened to one of our customers. They spent six months labeling their documents. They trained a model that was able to extract out these entities. Uh, and then when they tried to productionize it and provide it as a solution to pe other people in, uh, in their company, they realized that they needed to change the schema. So they essentially had to start from scratch. So, um, and then lastly, uh, converting to raw text can lose information. We have uh, incredible text-based models, but for document extraction in particular, we've seen that being able to add spatial information and images does improve performance and all of the state-of-the-art models are able to combine all of this information together in the extraction process. So in the left here, you see um, the original layout um, and you can see that for a particular number, uh, what the row is and what the column is. And so you have that relative spatial information. And so you're able to determine what that number is referring to. And then in contrast, in the, in the right, uh, when you have just the raw text format, um, even for humans, it can be difficult to disambiguate what exactly this is referring to. Um, so spatial information is quite important in these document extraction problems. So how does Snorkel tackle all of this? Um, Snorkel has this unique data-centric development paradigm. And so for people who have been attending the FTKI talks um, over the past couple of days, um, this is probably really familiar, but bear with me as I, as I walk through it again. Um, uh, with Snorkel's workflow, you pro label programmatically. You don't use manual labels. Um, you're able to combine these programmatic labels together using weak supervision. And then you're able to like train an end model using your programmatic labels. Finally, you can analyze your model using our suite of error analysis tools, and then use that analysis to feed back into your programmatic labels to iterate on your data and further improve that model that you're going to use. I want to dive into this a little bit further to really drive home how this works. Um, you can think of labeling functions as being able to encode domain knowledge. Um, you could have an expert who says that this certain pattern I expect will be repeated in the data. And you can encode that, that logic as a labeling function. Uh, and the only constraint that we have is that it's better than random. Uh, we have um, Snorkel's label model that will combine and denoise all of these labels. And this is based on a bunch of peer-reviewed research that's been conducted by our co-founders and also our collaborators um, across the years. Uh, and then finally, you can train an end model that generalizes beyond the probabilistic labels. So this process is theoretically grounded, and it's also been empirically proven out um, as we've iterated through it. So let's look at a real example for document extraction to, to really sort of drive this home. Um, this was a real use case that came to Snorkel. We had um, an investment banking team that wanted to extract entities from 10Ks. Um, 10Ks are these company filings that they submit to the SEC in order to uh, you know, satisfy the reporting requirements of the US government. And they're very frequently used by investors to understand like the financial health of the company. Um, so we had this team of investment bankers, um, 40 to 50, 45 analysts, who would manually go through 10Ks to extract out relevant information. Um, they estimated that they spent about 12 to 15 hours a week doing this. Um, and for a single project, they'd spent over 250 hours in this manual extraction process. To narrow things down a little bit, um, they wanted to extract interest rate swaps specifically from 10K filings. Um, for the purpose of this discussion, all you need to know is an interest rate swap is a type of contract between two entities, and that allows them to change how interest rate payments are made. Um, and so this team wanted to be able to input 10K filings, uh, use Snorkel's model, and then have an output where we've derived the interest rate swaps, um, the associated information to it, and then also the surrounding context so that they're able to validate the extracted amounts. So how did we actually do this? Um, I had mentioned before that labeling functions are a way of like encoding domain knowledge. And the simplest way you can do this is through keywords. So a very simple LF, as we call it, is just 
checking for keywords in the in the context of a certain number. I could say that if the text swap is in the same sentence as this number, then label as an interest rate swap. So really simple to get started. Um, but you can also uh, define like complicated labeling functions. Um, for example, here, I want to be able to extract out the entity in the table. So uh, my LF would read um, if the, the if the number is in the same row as interest rate swap and the same column as notional, then label as interest rate swap. And we have these built-in templates that allow you to encode spatial information in this way. And we also have um, like SDK functionality that allows you to import your own external knowledge sources and uh, define your own custom logic where you're able to make use of Snorkel's internal representation of text and spatial information to define like whatever complex logic you would like to. Um, so for this particular project, we worked with the, the team of subject matter experts to define a set of labeling functions and build out an end model to extract out interest rate swap amounts. The end result of this was uh, it significantly cut down the time taken to review a single document. This team said that the time they, they would spend reviewing each document, which was about 15 to 30 minutes, got cut down to about three minutes. That's incredible. That's like a five to 10x improvement in the, the speed uh, at which they're able to review these documents. It's also like really significant in sort of shifting the way that they spend their time. Um, they've moved from doing document review, which is like really manual and tedious, uh, to more creative downstream work, which is like the analysis and the like client conversations and then so on. This is just one use case that we've done with document extraction, uh, but we've worked on a wide range of use cases. Like we've been able to extract insights from clinical studies. Uh, we've looked at um, you know extracting out um, information about wells from like drilling reports um we've looked at In this next section, I want to talk about um, what, you know, the, the really exciting stuff, uh, our forward looking work, where we're trying to leverage foundation models to make this data centric at your knowledge sources and foundation models into Snorkel, use our approach of programmatic labeling and guided error analysis to iterate, and then take your adapted find, a foundation model that you can use for your particular application. Um, note that um, I say foundation model here and not large language model or you know generative AI. Uh, and that's because we believe that it's it generalizes beyond just language. Um, and it's not just generative use cases. Like these models are very effective even for predictive use cases that we've traditionally focused on with, with Snorkel flow. Um, so how does this apply to document extraction specifically? Um, we've tried a, a few different things in the document extraction space that I want to share today. Um, the first is automating the initial labeling of documents. Um, and the way we do this is by using what we call embedding models. Um, so you can think of an embedding model as mapping a certain context or text to a numeric uh, high dimensional space. So you can move from um, chunks of text to this vector space where similar groups of texts are grouped together in that space. So as an example, like if I had a document and I had different paragraphs that were say describing a certain policy definition, I would expect that when I embed these paragraphs in this space, all of the, all of the texts that refers to that policy definition are clustered together. In this way, I can automatically label my data without requiring any manual input from the user using these like embeddings. Another way that we've tried to make LF 
iteration really simple for people is by leveraging extractive document visual question answering models. So that was a mouthful. Um, document visual question answering models are trained to answer questions based on documents. And they combine a range of like text, layout, and image inputs in order to do this. Um, and there's a few different uh, models that are available in the open source uh, that we've experimented with. with, with. So mapping back to our previous example, you could imagine that if I have um, a page from a 10K document, I could ask, what is the interest rate swap amount in natural language? Uh, pass these as inputs to this doc VQA model, and then get an answer of like that particular entity along with a confidence score and its location in the document. I can map this answer to a labeling function. Uh, and even if it's noisy and not perfect, that's really useful in, in order for us to very quickly start this uh, labeling function iteration process. Um, so, and then lastly, I think uh, perhaps the most exciting one is uh, with using large language models that are sort of everywhere. Um, we found that the generative capabilities for large language models to do question answering and code generation is really helpful, even in the predictive use cases that we've been working with. Um, so you can use large language models to define keyword or regular expression based LFs. You can use it to define your own custom code LFs, where we provide like our internal templates in the context. Uh, or you can use it to directly extract out entities from these documents. So um, for example, in the same interest rate swap example, you could say, write a labeling function to extract swaps from this document, provide a template to this model, and it will uh, it will provide a code, uh, like a code example that you could use to like label your own data. And we've integrated with really common large language model providers, both with closed APIs and open source. Um, models here. Um, so to conclude, um, I think with Snorkel, we're able to effectively tackle some of the key challenges involved in document extraction. Um, we're able to move away from inefficient manual labeling using Snorkel's programmatic labeling approach. We can tackle high data variability by using N models that can that we can train to generalize beyond these heuristics. And finally, um, we're able to use templates and models that um, take advantage of the structural information and in documents and use that to extract out complex entities um, from these documents. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. Um, and you know, please ask questions here or over Slack and don't, don't hesitate to reach out if you'd like to get any details on any of the concepts that I've described here. Thank you so much, Ashwini. It was uh, very cool to see how you've applied these techniques to PDF documents, um, particularly uh, in the 10K filing uh, use case. We do have a couple questions here uh, that I will read out for you. Um, the first one is, how is Snorkel differentiated from other document AI solution solutions, mm -hmm. such as Instabase or Azure Form Recognizer? Yeah, I think that's a that's a great question. Um, I didn't quite uh, get to dive into that during the talk, but I think there's essentially like three key ways you can think about how the solutions are different, right? So um, if you look at the document AI marketplace, there's essentially solutions that, that fall under three buckets. You have rule-based systems, um, which are brittle. They don't deal with data variability. Uh, you have pre-built ML models and templates. And these are great if you have, um, you know, a really common document structure. Say you're, you're trying to extract from like passport images, you could probably find a pre-trained model that's really effective at doing that because the, the like format of that document is, you know, um, it's like shared even if there is some variability um, across like the years and things like that. Um, but they would fail to generalize beyond the like, document set that they've been trained on. And then finally, you do have uh, providers that allow you to like train your own custom models. Um, but you know, that requires a large amount of training data. And so Starkle is the only only provider that allows you to, you know, train your own custom models, but also take advantage of this programmatic labeling approach that really mitigates um, the issues that we see with like manual labeling. 
That makes sense. Very, yeah. very thought through answer. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, the next question is about pre-processing. How does Snorkel tackle the challenges with pre-processing PDF documents? Do you have some type of OCR solution? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, you can, we actually use just pre-built OCR. Uh, and so we're not an OCR provider. You could think of us as downstream to the OCR process where we move beyond OCR to like, you know, capture like complex entities. Um, we use a range of open source solutions. And then we also, you know, we'll, we'll use closed solutions like Azure Form Recognizer, you know, Google Doc Parser. We have partnerships with these larger companies that, that provide these solutions. And we're, we're able to like build on top of that to like bring our programmatic approach to this problem. Um, That's nice that you're able to build on top of those other layers. Yeah. Um, with the uh, large language models and foundation models uh, that people are trying to use now across many different industries, how does that apply here? Can you use a large language model to extract entities from a document? Yeah, I think that's another great question. I think that's something that, you know, we've been, you know, thinking about um, ever since, you know, we saw ChatGPT come out. Um, and I think um, this is, I think, a great reference, which I was wondering if I should, you know, put in my, my talk. But um, so you can think of it as there's a trade-off between uh, cost uh, uh, latency and then quality when you're figuring out how to use large language models for an extraction problem. Um, you know, if you wanted to pass your entire document through a large language model, that's definitely possible. You can use existing libraries to like essentially chunk your document, pass the chunks through um, the large language model and then be able to extract out whatever entities that you want. But given the number of tokens that you would expect, you know, an, an ongoing cost. So uh, it's not just during development, like if if part of your deployment relies on inference with large language model, that's that cost is going to like quickly add up. And so the reason I wanted to uh, sort of highlight this paper and kind of call that out is because they explored two approaches. They explored um, just using uh, direct extraction, which they call evaporate direct. And then also by you know using the LLM to generate candidate uh, functions, which they combined using weak supervision. So they call this evaporate code plus. Um, so this is a paper from uh, Professor Chris Lay's lab, uh, that, like written by some of his students quite recently. And they found that actually Evaporate Code Plus performed better than direct extraction by 12.1 F1 points on average, uh, which is kind of incredible, right? So you can use this approach of, of still using like the incredible sort of code generation capabilities of LLMs, uh, but not have to do like a linear pass to all of your documents. And you're still able to extract out the kind of entities that you would want from, from these documents. That's a great improvement, um, that F1 yeah. score bump. So cool to see uh, that the, the layers, the code um, can help beyond just what the large language model does. Um, you use hugging face models sometimes to write LFs. And so the question here is how do you choose from available foundation models? Mm -hmm. Which ones do you choose to power um, LFs and how do you make that decision? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I, I would say part of it is, um, part of how we choose external resources is sort of driven by just licensing constraints. So, um, you know, obviously we're, we're restricted to things that we can use for commercial use even if we do have like incredible open source models that are really effective um, on say benchmarks, they're just not available to us. So that sort of immediately disqualifies things like Open Llama or even Layered LMV2 and V3, which were just great models for document AI, but we're, we don't have access to them. And then of the subset of models that we do have access to, I think the, the honest answer is some degree just like trial and error as we kind of um, iterate through it. But there's some guiding principles you can use. So for example, uh, if you look at the, um, you know, the embedding based approach, 
you you could expect that say models that are trained with say a contrastive loss would do better than just like uh, models that are computing embeddings for different purposes, right? Uh, because the contrastive loss makes the model group similar text together and different text far apart, and that kind of uh, ties nicely to our goal of like why we're using an embedding model here. Um, and so you can kind of it part it's partly a process of like looking through um, their uh, paper papers and their experiments and then also just trying it out on sample data ourselves as we as we figure out what the optimal thing to use. And another neat thing to note is um, we really think about like whether it could be used by customers. And so model size does come into play. Uh, for some customers, they want to be able to download the models. They don't want to like send it to an inference endpoint. And by when we have that sort of constraint, we would have to pick a model that's say smaller than one GB as a random example. So, um, so it's a it's a uh, I would say there's like many factors in that decision making process, but really depends on the use case and uh, like the customer and what they're trying to do. That makes sense. It makes sense that you'd have to consider a lot of different things. Yeah. Uh, but it's cool that this one has worked out here. Yeah. Um, we have a question about the use case that you talked about with 10K filings. Um, mm -hmm. 10K filings generally have similar formats across companies. How does this type of approach work when the documents have more heterogeneity, such as international filings, which will vary more across country to country? Oh, I mean, I think that's a. I, I guess that's a um, that's a good question. I would say actually, like say, ten Ks have like really standard formatting when you have something like a balance sheet, right? Because I think each row in a balance sheet is supposed to have certain like items on it, right? You're supposed to talk about your assets, your liabilities, etc. And so all of that is like really structured. So you know that's somewhat straightforward to deal with, even with like less complex solutions, but. Um, the example that I shared, actually, you can see like these are interest rate swaps and they do have very high variability. Um, I, did they, I guess, in the question specify what they meant by like the variability in, in their data? Um, because I would say like in general, our approach is to get an understanding of the data distribution and then try to define labeling functions that um, can be very high precision on a certain slice of data. And we repeat that process until we feel comfortable that we've sort of covered the like range of, of sort of data variability that we're seeing. Um, um, if, if there's follow-up questions, they can connect with you in the Slack after on that one. Okay. Um, another question about uh, this UI here. Um, one of the participants noticed that the accuracy, precision, and coverage for a labeling function is showing up um, as you compute, uh, mm -hmm. as you as you create those labeling functions. Um, mm -hmm. How does Snorkel compute those metrics? Yeah, I think that's a that's a great question. So I will say that this is a mock. It's not um, it's not a screenshot of our UI. Um, it's more a conceptual rendering. Um, but we um, we have what we call um, like we have a sample um, of label data and we can kind of estimate the precision and coverage based on it. Uh, and then we also try to estimate what how well it's doing on sort of the unlabeled data as well. So, uh, and that's built based on certain heuristics that um, actually one of our research team members has defined. So um, I'm happy to kind of go into more detail um, in the chat if, if that would be helpful. Yeah. Um, and then the last question here, uh, it says in the example with the two if statements where you have the row equal to the interest rate and then the column equal to uh, the notation. Yeah, perfect. What is the process of extract extracting all of the row and column names? Is that automated or do you have to manually add those uh, via dropdown? Yeah, I think um, it's not manual. Um, I think for um, row information, it's, it's pretty straightforward. I think we sort of naturally processed PDFs row wise. And um, so it's it's fairly easy to determine what text is in the same row for a particular PDF. The column is a little more complicated and um, we use um, a combination of like table detection and structure recognition to figure out what um, like say a column header is for a particular entity. And we do a, this process in the pre-processing. Um, if we feel like 
extracting from tables could be really helpful. We also have templates for other layout information that you might want to use, like say checkboxes um, or headers and things like that. Um, and this is something that we continue to sort of iterate on depending on like the new use cases that we see. Great, thank you so much, Ashwini. Uh, it was great to have your perspective here today. And that was a wonderful presentation. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much.